Merci d'être là. Uh, thank you for coming. We're going to continue our investigation from uh, materials encountered by chance uh, all the way to made to measure materials. And I told you that aspects of modeling were becoming increasingly important, not separately from experimentation, but together with experimentation to try to improve materials performance. But until now, I've only discussed materials. I've talked about varied materials, structured materials, multi-materials. Um, of course, a material is a matter with a function, but it needs to be implemented. It needs to be shaped and potentially assembled in order to obtain a component. As we saw in the lecture about durability, um, one also needs to have protection systems. Um, so uh, the problem with high performance materials is not only a problem of material of the material itself, it's a problem of implementation. You're going to say, so what's the relationship with uh, integrated modeling, which is uh, the title of today's lecture? what you find in books are bricks of modeling uh, where you pretty much know what is happening pretty much validated by experimentation essentially we have the tools to understand quantify and predict what is going to happen but when you go into the real world um, from your lab to a factory um, what you will see is that the material rarely has an isothermal uh, treatment, there are going to be temperature transformations, phase transformations, there are going to be deformations uh, coupled with phase transformations. All of this is involved, meaning that you're going to need to arrange the various elementary bricks in a coherent manner in order to use what I call integrated modeling in order to best design the material. This approach is going to be particularly important when implementing material. If you look at a welding problem with um, classic welding, you have in within three or four centimeters all of metallurgy. You've melted, you've solidified, you have a thermal treatment, you've recrystallized, you're going to have grain growth, you're going to have phase transformation. Um, you're going to be cutting, um, if it doesn't work properly, you're going to be cutting along the dotted line. So within these very few centimeters, everything's going to be happening. So, so it's not the material, it's the part that you're interested in. And you, you need to see how the implementation of the material has changed the characteristics, which is why I want to discuss integrated modeling. And what I'm going to do basically is to prepare um, the following two seminars. The, there's going to be one in the morning dedicated to a welding technique that I discussed in uh, uh, the inaugural uh, lecture. Oud Simar will discuss this. And early in the afternoon in room four, as part of this afternoon of the afternoon workshops, there will be a second seminar by Alexis Deschamps about various aspects of materials implementation um, in alu aluminium alloys. So what I'm going to do essentially this morning is prepare uh, the field for them, in a sense, by showing you configurations where uh, elementary bricks of modeling exist, but and how you can piece them together. So if I reposition this within our good old map, strangely enough, the colors change from one lecture to another, but we are here now. Implementation, integrated modeling. That is one of the aspects of materials optimization. So if we have a look at what we'll be discussing later, next week we will be discussing something quite specific. We're going to be talking about eco-design of materials, and we're going to be focusing on a particular problem issue. It is thermal management of in construction, and that'll be next week's uh, lecture. And the week after that, it will be extreme conditions, which will be highly exotic, because in the afternoon what we'll be doing in the workshop is discussing uh, two cases that are particularly extreme, um, the ITR uh, fusion reactor and fourth generation molten salt reactor, to say that what is required of the materials is so extreme that we don't have materials to address that. So we're going to talk about things that we don't know how to do and how can we handle that. Uh, maybe ideas will emerge from our discussions, hopefully. So these are things 
that we're discussing are uh, uh, things that we know how to do. So integrated modeling is essentially that. To have a suitable, obviously not perfect, but a suitable description of a few elementary phenomena, solidification, deformation, recovery, recrystallization, precipitation, and there are a certain number of situations with uh, phenomena that are either concomitant or competing. I'll give you several examples um, in increasing order of complexity. I'm going to tell you about the uh, properties of cast alloys. Then I'll tell you about static or dynamic recrystallization. And I shall finish with recrystallization of microalloyed steels. Um, a final example where you'll have it all. But I won't be uh, telling you a lot about processes. But these are going to be building blocks that you will uh, discover in the seminars. So let's start with a relatively uh, simple integrated modeling case. Uh, simple, obviously, because I've chosen the simple part of the problem. Understanding the mechanical properties of cast alloys is obviously not simple. If you take a cast part, very often the part there's going to be a section of the part with different thicknesses. These different thicknesses are going to give different solidification speeds. These speeds are going to result in different microstructures, uh, different states, uh, different concentration profiles. And if you have a thermal treatment on that, you have a material which is intrinsically heterogeneous. What I do want to show is how such a complex problem um, can give rise to a coupling between classic models of uh, a physical modeling. So I'm going to be focusing on the most simple case, which is the uh, yield stress, the elasticity limit. When you're going to be asking uh, the real questions, um, for, for example, resistance to fatigue, things become much more complicated. So basically, to keep things simple, let's take an aluminum copper uh, alloy, a simple alloy. On the left, you have the uh, classic uh, diagram here of aluminum copper, high temperature, they mix properly, lower temperature, um, there's a precipitation of little clusters of copper in uh, the aluminum, plus various other faces I won't go into. Um, and on the right, you have a temperature and time graph that tells you are the various states the material is going to go through. High temperature, solidification, and once you've solidified it, you're going to homogenize it. And once you've done that, homogenize it means making sure that the spread of materials is reasonably homogeneous. And then there's a thermal treatment to result in precipitation. So basically, this is a case that is not too difficult in the sense that it happens in a sequence based on the uh, material's solidification history, how are the elements of solidity uh, distributed? Which are the ones that are going to result in precipitation? And uh, precipitation is going to result in hardening of the alloy. So you can see here that you have elementary building blocks here. You need to understand solidification, homogenization, precipitation, and hardening. Um, so I've given you a certain number of chapters of a, a physical metallurgy manual. Um, so solidification models are going to result based on the solidification speed, on the uh, solution um, spread from the heart of the dendrite to the uh, border of the dendrite. So homogenization model, of course, which is going to have diffusion equations that are going to say how based on a heterogeneous a spread you can have a uh, you can have a totally um, homogeneous uh, spread. Then, when you have a totally homogeneous spread of solution, when you have a thermal treatment, as aluminium is a good heat conductor, if the parts are not too thick, you can imagine the temperature is homogeneous. But in any case, it's homogeneous on the dendrite scale. So what you're doing is you're heating a dendrite. Um, where the profile is not necessarily fully homogeneous. At every point of the dendrite, you're going to have a precipitation. If it doesn't occur quickly enough, it means every little area that is transforming is, in a sense, independent from the neighboring zone, which is not quite true, of course. 
uh, if precipitation takes time, you're going to start to have exchanges between the various zones. So here, if you want to have a fine precipitation that happens quickly, essentially, see this is the perfectly spherical cow, um, the uh, dendrite, um, the sphere here, a constant, uh, you have a, a particular uh, copper concentration, it becomes enriched in copper, and there's going to be a composition gradient between the core and the edge of the dendrite. When you have all of this, you apply your thermal treatment, and you can find out uh, what the fraction of precipitates is going to be. When you have that, you can use classic um, uh, elasticity limits, and then you have a series of shells with different elasticities. You can do, you can be more or less refined there. Let's see that they all have. Uh, the main uh, rate of work hardening, hardening, or it depends on the microstructure, as Udzima uh, will show you. But basically, what you can have are various shells with different mechanical properties, a model of micromechanic uh, to show what the overall uh, shell um, stacking results in. So just a simple way to examine these calculations is to have the knockdown factors. You can say the maximum is what I'm going to obtain if I have perfectly homogenized the solution, if it is uh, for a given amount um, completely spread across all of the shells, and therefore I just have one shell with homogeneous properties. So what you have here are elasticity limitation, limit uh, calculations in the shell stacking, normalized Um, on where you have uh, fully homogenized the composition. All of the copper is now in the solution. And here you can see it on two different alloys, one 3% copper, one 5% copper. You have the elasticity limit based on the uh, uh, volumic fraction. But then you have various curves with um, various graphs with different thermal treatments and different cooling times. Um, various degrees of complexity. And what's interesting to see is that the parameter that uh, that dominates here is essentially um, the fact that solidification is going to be very much connected to the ulterior elasticity limits because it controls the amount of solution that remains inside. So there were plenty of good reasons to think that you were opening a coupling, but in fact the coupling is rather simple. Once you've solidified what remains inside the grains, and based on what remains inside the grain, there's the overall elasticity limit. And what you can also see, the fact that it's more or less homogenized, is much more important than knowing um, what remains at the end of the homogenization. So that was a case which uh, essentially solidification gives structure, you precipitate and see the result. Now we're going to examine something slightly more complex. It's recrystallization. So recrystallization can be either static, where things happen in a sequence, or dynamic, meaning that you uh, deform at the same time as you reheat. So uh, deforming or reheating, um, you have models that are essentially reliable, but then how do you combine these two models in order to obtain uh, something that can be used as an integrated model? So let's have a look at recrystallization. You have uh, deformed something sufficiently to uh, have uh, dislocations which have increased the uh, free energy. And the excess energy that you have is essentially the, the uh, dislocation density, uh, half uh, times uh, dens uh, dislocation density um, as per this equation. And what the materials want to do, if given a chance, um, giving a chance means heating, basically. You allow the atoms to move around, and if you allow this, they're going to try to get rid of it. So there are essentially two ways of getting rid of that. 
there's the gentle way and there's the tough way. The gentle way is what is called recovery. Uh, the uh, faults are pretty much going to um, cancel each other, reorganize, but you don't really want to change the crystalline structure. You want to preserve more or less the same orientations. And basically, it's going to happen homogeneously. When you use recrystallization, things are very different. You're going to have clean grains which are going to grow on behalf of uh, grains that are full of uh, deformations. So there's a the clean grain is actually eating up the deformed grains. So these two mechanisms have very different spatial distributions. They also have uh, very um, uh, different uh, distributions in terms of time. Re recovery is very slow. It's logarithmic. Recrystallization is fast. You have an incubation time, and then you have a uh, growth germination, and then you've eaten away so much of the dislocation that there is no longer any force, and this is saturation. So both, in fact, soften the material. So there are a whole lot of subtleties, of course, knowing uh, what are the orientations of the grains, subgrains, and so on. Well, I'm just going to give you the broad outline of what we're examining. So we're softening this material. So, if we continue to draw a parallel, you know that I'm a comparatist at heart, you can say that recovery or recrystallization can be either static or dynamic. Static means there is no additional constraint. You wait for things to happen with the forces that are internal to the material you've made. Dynamic means that you are imposing a constraint and seeing how, how things are going to happen. So, static recovery, you deform, you stick it in the oven and you wait for it to um, happen and low temperature. Dynamic means you have a look at how the uh, faults uh, can cancel each other. And that is what, uh, for instance, is going to mean that it's not going to harden indefinitely as you deform it. So for recrystallization, you have the same uh, difference. Static recrystallization, you put it in an oven with a higher temperature, it creates new grains, it becomes, the material becomes soft, but you can also put it a higher uh, oven while deforming it. And there you can have both new grains appearing, which are soft, in a hard matrix, and you're deforming the whole thing. And you can feel that there's an additional difficulty here. How can you redeform something that you've already started to recrystallize? So we're going to have a look at um, uh, static annealing recovery um, by starting with recovery. So recovery is basically a test of internal uh, relaxation. You have a material that's been deformed that's full of dislocation uh, faults, which create internal constraints. And under the effects of this field of constraints, uh, there's going to be a minor slow deformation of the material. And there's going to be a trade-off between the plastic deformation with internal constraints between the state of initial deformation with internal constraint that's going to lead to a plastic, a very highly localized plastic deformation uh, and a relaxation of the internal um, constraints. That is the recovery mechanism. It's a, um, it was the equation was created quite a while ago by uh, Friedel Kuhlmann uh, Wilsdorf. There's a logarithmic uh, rationale at work. What you need to have in this particular instance, if you want to go a bit beyond that, to have a more than phenomenology, you need to go down into the finer details of how dislocation density uh, is changing. If you have the dislocation density, if you basically have the internal constraints resulting from that, the uh, plastic force and therefore the relaxation of these internal uh, constraints evokes the dislocation density. You bundle all that with an evolution equation and for this uh, static recovery, which I showed in the previous lecture, the one before that, you have one single internal variable. You keep it as simple as possible. So how do you stick that into an equation? You have the uh, raw dislocation density, rho. Uh, you will see that they vary as a reverse of the distance. If you have rho dislocation and the distance between two uh, dislocation is uh, half squared of that 
a squared of rho, and it's therefore going to be the square. It's going to be the square of the dislocation density. Second equation here, you have a, a plastic relaxation test, an evolution of the internal stress um, of time the modulus. And then when you bundle all of that together, you have an evolution equation of the um, uh, dislocation density. And this little thingamajig here, which is essentially something that connects uh, things to the speed of uh, a dislocation migration. So the important thing here is not all the math. It's the uh, spirit behind all of the math. So of course, all of this works pretty well. Um, you have an elasticity limit here based on various uh, reheating uh, times. So um, we're talking about high tech, and one high tech item is the can of Coke. To know how a can of Coke works mechanically, it's when you actually reheat the varnish on uh, the can or the beer can, um, if you prefer me not to say Coca Cola. So let's look now at the slow aspect of things. If you increase temperature, you're going to have a recrystallization mechanism, uh, mechanism. Very quickly, in a sense, you're going to face a recurring problem that you have in metallurgy. Um, things that you can't understand are usually connected to germination. It's the very beginning of things. It's kind of big bang of big trouble. Um, and here we're going to examine recrystallization. And the problem with that essentially is finding out what the germination is. So here I'm actually showing you the elementary building blocks that we're going to be assembling together. So if you want recrystallization, if you want the new germ to appear with no uh, dislocations, with a matrix that is within a matrix that's full of dislocations, what you need is a sufficient driving force to overcome capillarity forces when you create the smaller the germ, the greater the forces. So you want to crush the little grain you've created. So you need a driving force that's sufficient to overcome that. And second thing you need, much more difficult to take into account, is that you need to have a sufficiently mobile interface because it wants to move. And that can be reflected either in a disorientation of the interface or a local misorientation gradient. And there are a lot of very fine experimental studies that have been made where you can uh, look very locally um, the threshold of disorientation where a new germ can appear in a highly deformed material. So I said that digital simulation could be useful in the field of uh, technological innovation in materials. Uh, this is a particular instance. Um, which in fact shows you a little bit what happens. It's a pretty picture of what seems to be happening in certain recrystallization modalities. What you have here is a digital simulation of a granular structure, um, which you uh, examine. You examine the top of the grains. It's a, a vertex type simulation. It's a dynamic, um, a dynamic assessment of uh, the various points between several summits. So this is a 2D drawing. If you look at a 3D drawing, it's the same. Um, but um, in fact, computers aren't powerful enough uh, to do it on a sufficient number of grains to be significant. So if you look at the 2D imaging, you have the first grain. You have two lines that are a little bit darker here. And these are grains with high misorientation, high energy, high mobility. And between the grains, between the two horizontal lines, the two big grains, as it were, you have a structure of little subgrains, which are not very mobile and not very disoriented, misoriented. So you reheat that, and the system evolves in a determinist ma manner. Uh, the evolution determines things, and this evolution results uh, quite obviously in reducing the total stored energy. Um, you have capillary energy here. So what you tend to do is to grow uh, the grains. And uh, quite interestingly, you have growth of subgrains. Flat grains, you can't really see why they uh, want, actually want to move. Um, essentially, you have the curve here. And uh, 
basically things should remain motionless, but that's not what's happening. Um, if you have a subgrain that has grown more in one place than in another, you have these mechanisms here appearing, where the big grain is actually a bulging, uh, creating a bulge uh, into the neighboring grain. And you see that what you're doing here is that naturally in this uh, digital simulation, you have grains that are essentially free of faults growing uh, to the detriment of areas that were full of faults. So you can say this is all very well and good, but quite frankly, this was invented by Balian Hirsch in the 50s, uh, far before there was any um, simulation. So uh, we're just using computers to um, reflect very simple stuff that was known experimentally. But you see that, in fact, this whole issue of germination is not a, a problem of fluctuation in the thermodynamic sense. You're not just making a little agglomerate here. What you're doing, what you're creating, is that you have instability and not germination in the thermodynamic sense. Um, If you have a thermodynamics uh, calculation here, in terms of germ size, you have germ size which is probably between 5 and 10 microns, and it's actually completely impossible to imagine that you have 5 to 10 uh, cubic microns cubed, which all of a sudden say, OK, let's get rid of the dislocation and grow peacefully. So you have something that's not um, like that. Now. The classic germination argument, um, you have a critical size beyond which you are encouraging volume effects and below which they dominate. Um, th this is actually purely dimensional. It doesn't say anything about the um, uh, mechanisms. You have um, a surface and, uh, in fact, um, the size below which capillarity uh, dominates, and then there's below or on, and above which it is dominated. Now, the mechanism, in order to describe in a more quantitative manner this germination mechanism, you're going to write a few simple equations. You're going to say that the migration speed is going to be proportional to the driving force, which gives a gives you an, an equation for the evolution in size of the grains, and then you're going to describe mobility, which may depend on orientation. So you're actually growing these subgrains, and when they reach a critical size, um, what happens is that capillarity, in a sense, is erased, or at least mitigated, and you're going to have your driving force gradient that's going to become important. So when the driving force is greater than this critical size, or rather, when you have 2 gamma over R, that's capillarity, and here it's a, a volume. And when it's greater, you can have growth of the subgrain, meaning that for each subgrain, you have a critical size, which is 2 gamma over G. And when it's greater than that, you can have your bulge. Another interesting thing is I put, I put here a GT, um, as I've introduced the time factor. That's how our coupling things. You don't need to be schizophrenic, of course, when you're doing material science. When I was saying at l very low temperature, recovery occurs. You're reducing stored faults. You're therefore reducing stored energy. Now, if you increase the temperature, you have recrystallization. You don't need to believe me. There's no reason to believe that recrystallization um, erases re uh, recovery. So, in fact, the first coupling term that you can use here is that in view of how energy is restored, I showed you how it could be described with a, a restoration model. Um, how, when you know how energy restores itself, the critical radius where you have recrystallization can itself change based on time. So, a very simple diagram. I've just talked about one critical radius, but there, there are in fact several. Uh, nature is actually quite clever, because if you look at the various rates that have different subgrain sizes, if you normalize the size of subgrains with, uh, with that, you will always have the same type of distribution. The only thing that accounts is the normalized size 
versus the average size of the subgreens. So let's do something very simple. What's happening? As I am obtaining recovery, I have growth of the subgrains, allowing me to reduce stored energy, meaning that the distribution in size of my subgrains is actually moving towards the right. And then here you have the critical radius. Critical radius is when the subgrains are above that, they can give rise to a grain. So when you're shifting that towards the right, you're going to have subgrains which increasingly become critical. So naturally, you're going to have germs of recrystallization appearing. But to be a consistent, you're changing the size of subgrains, and therefore you're changing the stored energy, and therefore you're changing the crit critical radius. So here it tells you when it can start germinating. It's also going to be shifting towards the right because you're, inc you're reducing the available energy and therefore increasing the critical size from which the capital capil capillarity force will be overcome. So you have something here that's shifting towards the right, uh, the right uh, on, on the diagram, and then you have critical size that's shifting in the same manner. So what's the limit? If this one shifts towards the right quicker than this one, you're going to end up in a situation where recrystallization will never happen because you'll always be in a case when the only thing you can do is to reduce the energy homogeneously. However, if you are here where this one is a bit slower, you can have all of these subgrains that are potentially can become germination sites. So. Um, the direct consequence of that is, on the one hand, that you can have situations in which there is no recrystallization, or where there is, but there's also a likelihood that it can become a germination site. So if you look at the germination uh, in the grains, the number of potential sites is going to be the size of the grains squared divided by the subgrains squared, and it's only a proportion that are going to be germination sites. And you can calculate the germination rate based on time. So I've just described the uh, different elementary mechanisms. You have all of the ingredients here. Uh, and I've done what I call an integrated uh, modeling. I have recovery. I showed you how that could be described. I have subgrain growth, stuff that has been uh, studied elsewhere. That's the type of equation one can use. Um, uh, cell distribution, there's no actual um, reliable model to understand the distribution, so this is essentially empirical. And then Bailey Hirsch, the Bailey-Hirsch criterion, um, with just a dimensional justification here, I showed you how it could appear in a digital simulation. So you bundle all of this together, and you can calculate your germination rate and the number of germs you're going to obtain. And once you have them, it's a piece of cake. You say I have an interface. Uh, driving force, difference between nothing and stored energy. All you need to do is to write the growth rate of the interface. It's um, a pretty tough math, but um, essentially there's no new physics required. So if we move on to the next step, I'm just going to try to do in my in continuing the coupling. So if I say I don't want to do it while material is sitting in the oven. I want to do it while I'm deforming it. So you can see there's an additional degree here is that the stored energy, I need to add the fact that if I'm continuing to deform, it's going to continue to change. But at the same time, I have something that's recrystallizing heterogeneously. Here, for instance, you have very pretty pictures here where you have kinds of little necklaces here of tiny little grains. Um, behind the former grains. Typical dynamic recrystallization. So you have a grain here, still very deformed, with this little string of uh, low deformation grains. So what you need to understand is how this stuff is going to behave. Because you're trying to deform macroscopically something which microscopically is heterogeneous. So how do you do that? Well, you a couple things together. So what I'm going to be telling you is that we're going to be applying the rule of Occam's razors. Uh, we're not trying to find any additional reasons. I told you that dislocations are dumb, and there's no particular reason for dislocations to behave differently when you have uh, static or dynamic recovery. It's the same driving force. So the idea is 
simply by putting the germination criteria for static germination, coupling that with a micro-mechanical model that says how you need to partition deformation between deformed and undeformed grains, when you uh, chuck all of that together, is it not sufficient to describe dynamic recrystallization? It's not true in every case, but um, in some cases, what you note is that what one has understood about the germination of static recrystallization can be used for dynamic recrystallization. So the principle is now well known. You have grain distribution. Each grain has a size D, a an orientation M, and a density a rho. And uh, uh, obviously, then you put an an, an indice uh, to all of that. And uh, what you're going to do is examine, monitor the change of one grain based on a matrix, which is the average of all other grains around it. And that's how you can describe re dynamic recrystallization. You're going to try to see how the dislocation density within a grain is changing. And that is obviously going to depend on the way in which it is different from all other grains. That's a very simple reason. You put something soft in something hard, you deform it, it's the soft stuff that's going to deform much more than a hard stuff. So um, you just need to express that in a slightly more scientific manner. Uh, there's a whole field of uh, heterogeneous materials examines that. Or there's a more simple way, which is to say, okay, if I want to capture this, suggested by Olivier Boisiz, actually, to say, oh, I dissipate energy homogeneously. There's no reason fundamentally for that to be true. But it actually encapsulates in a simple way the fact that a uh, hard grain deforms more than soft grain, and in fact the elasticity limit uh, times the um, deformation increment uh, results in that. To integrate the heterogeneous aspect, what you can do is have a mechanical calculation that shows that it's actually not a bad idea. So just to give you a little bit um, the ingredients, the first equation we say that it's the flow uh, constraint based on grain size and dislocation density within grain, you've seen equations that look pretty much like that. Second equation is the evolution in dislocation density within a given grain. The epsilon I have here is the epsilon of the particular grain. I'm going to need to see how it partitions um, com as compared to the macroscopic scale because this grain and neighboring grain are not necessarily of similar hardness. And then the ISO work assumption where the grain constraint time the deformation of the grain is a constant. So one thing that's important, what's happening? I told you about averaging. One of the subtleties, if you average, what type of average must you do? What I'm going to show is that the average that you're going to do is based on the square of the size grain. You say basically an interface has an average speed and it's going to be divided into a certain number of sectors um, of the uh, grain within. So the driving force is going to be different for each of these sectors. So it's natural, of course, to average the squares of the grain sizes. Then once you have uh, obtained all that, you can, all of the parameters you need to describe all that, which is basically a result of plastic deformation apart from recrystallization or restoration stuff or re static recrystallization stuff. And based on that, you can obtain a results about dynamic recrystallization, the type of results you have, experimental um, on the left, theoretical on the right. You can have a look at the influence of grain size and so on and so forth. What I I've, what I've just tried to show you is that each of these elementary building blocks is documented in literature, but that they can be brought together to see how these phenomena can result in a recrystallization behavior um, simultaneously to deformation. So third example I would like to discuss today is a case where we have both recrystallization and precipitation. It's very important when you um, are developing microalloyed steels. Um, just have a look very briefly. We'll look very briefly at the motives and see the types of interactions that we can have, which will then lead me to, I'll give you the final example that has it all. I won't discuss it in any depth, but I'll tell you how the question needs to be uh, envisaged. So essentially, 
Uh, we have microalloyed steels with precipitation of uh, uh, carbon and nobium. Uh, you can see this is very trendy. Well, these are really nano materials. Can't can't be more nano than that. Below that is the atom, pretty much. So you can see that these nano precipitates are not evenly spread. They kind of decorate the uh, dislocation structure. So you have something deformed onto which you precipitate, and the fact that you precipitate, uh, in fact, it precipitates, precipitates just in the place where you have the faults uh, resulting from deformation. So you're going to do that in a various range of temperatures where you have precipitation and recrystallization. And I said, if you have recrystallization, there's no reason to believe that there's no recovery. Um, you have recrystallization, precipitation, and recovery. So how do you handle that mess? So first of all, why is it a question at all? Um, it's not neutral. Recrystallization is what allows you to calculate grain size, and grain size is essential to um, give you the mechanical properties of the steel in question. So it's not just an academic's uh, um, curiosity. It's just something that's essential to uh, assess the uh, final properties of these uh, microalloyed steels. So the uh, elementary building blocks you have is plastic deformation, recovery, recrystallization, precipitation, and then towards the end, you're going to need to have the austenite ferrite transformation. Um, what I just wanted to say is on this particular diagram, you have a certain number of approaches. For instance, plastic deformation, you can have purely phenomenological relationships, but you can also use uh, the invariable laws that I showed. Um, how the presence of dislocations allows you to understand the behavior and the plasticity. Recovery, the uh, kuhlman vilsdorf kinetics, um, you can use uh, these types of laws here. Recrystallization, I showed you how it could be uh, uh, properly uh, treated, how the germination and growth process could be properly handled. In this case, I will just show you we you do something much more simple, which is merely to use a macroscopic law of recrystallization to see how you can feed a physics into that. Precipitation, we're going to try and see how it can be uh, handled quite simply. You will see much more sophisticated treatments of precipitation in um, Udsimar's uh, presentation later on. So what are the types of couplings we have here? I showed you until now, it wasn't coupling, it was sequence. Second case, it was coupling, but uh, reasonably simple. Here you have, you have it pretty much, you have pretty much everything. If you look at the coupling between recrystallization and precipitation, for instance, if you start uh, recrystallization, you're going to be reducing the amount of dislocation and therefore the number of sites where you can have precipitation and therefore reducing precipitation. If you put precipitates they're going to be anchoring the migrations of the walls, so you're going to be delaying the growth of the grains that are recrystallizing. If you change precipitation, you change uh, the uh, rate of uh, solid solution and the mobile elements within the solid solution, which interact with the walls and the grain boundaries, will tend to... Uh, you're actually changing uh, the mobility of the grain boundaries. So. You already have three types of couplings here. Recrystallization and recovery, we've seen that before. Um, recrystallization reduces when you have recovery because you're actually reducing the driving force. And if you get the last one, precipitation and recovery, precipitation um, occurs in, in the dislocations. It's a reorganization of dislocations to relax internal stress. If you start out precipitates in there, you're going to prevent recovery. So there's going to be a change in the recovery kinetics because of precipitation. So you can see that this whole set of couplings, something you're really going to need to take into account to describe the whole phenomenon. So let's have a look at the ingredients we have here, what I call the elemental building blocks. Recrystallization um, is going to be described phenomenologically with uh, the Johnson-Mahir-Varami approach. Uh, 
but you also need to know how the presence of niobium and precipitates can change uh, the parameters. Uh, because you have driving force and you also have a mobility. How can mobility be modified by precipitation? Recovery can be described in terms of what I showed you before. And in terms of essential coupling, you need to see how precipitation of carbon nitrides uh, is going to change uh, rest or, um, recovery. And then you look at precipitation. Uh, you have a standard model of nucleation, growth, and and coarsening, uh, and this is going to happen on uh, the dislo dislocation sites. And you need to bring all of this together. So this is a situation where increasingly it's going to be really handicrafts. Um, I'm going to show you with an example. If you look at the modeling between recrystallization and precipitation, uh, you have the evolution here of the uh, volume fraction. Um, you have the number of germination sites, you have and an integ integral of driving force time mobility. So you have the density, dislocation density time um, UB2. It changes because you are um, actually recovering. Second part of the equation has the, um, the friction force that prevents uh, the Zener drag that prevents uh, movement, and you can see how uh, it changed. And then the psi 2t here, towards the top, is where can you have germs. Um, the germs in question cannot appear where there's too much precipitate, um, because you're not going to be um, movement in the grain subjoints. Uh, Subboundaries. So, what's the relationship between critical distance where you can have germination and the critical distance between precipitate? So, uh, the, uh, the, the final equation you have the uh, Kahn equation of solute drag here, intrinsic mobility of the material, and the correction to the intrinsic mobility connected to the rate of niobium, niobium in the solid solution, which depends on the precipitates, which also itself depends on the dislocation density and so on and so forth. So you can easily imagine that all of this is going to be quite complex, but just before that, another example. If you look at recovery versus precipitation, you, are, you have recovery of a dislocation structure. Uh, this is uh, for a material without precipitate. What I'm just saying here is that a certain number of these nodes here between the various dislocations are not free. They are trapped by the precipitate. So the fact that you're, you're in recovery mode here, uh, you have the first part of the equation if there's no precipitation. If there are precipitates on all of the nodes, of course you're not going to be able to recover at all. And uh, one way of taking that into account is to correct your precipitation kinetics. Um, with a node a fraction of nodes uh, occupied by precipitate, which is the one minus n over n c. So these are the various equations, the various interactions. I think probably if I start to look at them uh, individually, we'll probably still be here at two p.m. So I'm not going to, but I just wanted to show you how you can adapt the various building blocks and uh, put them together. So I've just got a little bit of time left. So comparison with experience. You have a constraint here based on time. And that is also connected to microstructural observations. You have something that decreases more or less um, in a more or less linear manner over time. And when you start to precipitate, you're actually slowing down the mechanism. And you finish with coalescence, uh, co coarsening. So if you look at a nickel uh, iron alloy, uh, work by uh, Hutchinson, um, Australia, um, Australia and uh, Canada, actually, uh, scientists, um, you have here the number of precipitates and the diameter of precipitates is both experimental data and modeling data. What I wanted to show you is that if you look at the softening fraction, 
uh, there are things that are actually very strange. People were wondering whether they hadn't uh, done something weird in their experimentation, but no. When you're reheating here, it you soften initially, and then you have a negative softening, meaning that you have a hardening. And what's blue here is the experimental. Oh, the circles is uh, experimental, and the blue graph is the modeling, because you have both recovery and recrystallization and precipitation that tend to soften, and um, and the other that tends to harden. So uh, things uh, can look pretty strange. But if you look at the uh, literature about microalloy about microalloyed steels, most of the data that exists, experimental data, is given in the form of a softening graph, softening hardening. Um, it's very difficult, based on that, to say that you have a recrystallized fraction because you're both recrystallization, recovery, and precipitation, and that's a great advantage of developing a physically based modeling because you can uncouple the macroscopic graph based on the various contributions. So here you have a precipitation state um, over time, and here. Uh, for the same system, you have a softening fraction here, blue, fact, um, a recrystallized fraction, and the experimental data. So everything that seems to be happening here initially, in fact, has nothing to, at all to do with recrystallization, which is quite important, because if you say you're just going to follow up uh, that and say, I'll just um, work on hardness and I can deduce a grain size, you've got it all wrong because nothing has happened in terms of recrystallization, whereas lots of things have happened in hardening. And this is all connected essentially to restoration and precipitation. So let me try to move just directly to the top. Just what I wanted to say, um, each of these elementary building blocks exists in literature you can see the modifications that needed to be made to these uh, building blocks to uh, put them together. And it allows you to deconvolute a macroscopic um, aspect. And I'm going to finish with the full Monty, uh, um, or the full English breakfast, to put things more mildly. Um, this is a instances where you can imagine a situation where you have all at once recrystallization, transformation, and precipitation. So, I mean, those who have the capacity to have all that, it's only steels where you have almost all of uh, mechanics. So think that you're laminating an austenite, you're rolling it. You can have, at the same time, recrystallization, uh, that is static or dynamic, to control your grain size. Then, if you have deformed austenite, not totally recrystallized. You're going to have austenite grains that still contain lots of dislocations, faults, and so on. And uh, if you're having phase transformation there, you're going to have interaction between phase transformation, austenite, ferrite, uh, for uncentered cubic to, and the fact that you have deformation in the grain. So you have a coupling here between the fact that you're more or less recrystallized and the fact that the transformation uh, occurs, and that's actually what's going to be controlling the size of ferritic grains, uh, an important aspect. Um, if you're working with microalloyed steels, you can also have the full Monty. You can have the austenite ferrite interface that's moving within a system which itself is oversaturated in terms of precipitation. So you can have a coupling between phase transformation, allotropic phase transformation, um, and a precipitation uh, connected to microalloyed steels, resulting. Uh, this is work in progress, actually, with Ben Chang and, and Wuni in uh, Grenoble. Um, this is slightly older stuff to show that um, it's pretty significant, quite spectacular. This is austenite that's deformed at 30%, um, I think, where you have the ferritic transformation here. You have ferric grains that have appeared. It's the white here, the black here is martensite resulting from the austenite. There's not much. And then here, you can see with the same conditions, um, what happens on deformed austenite. So it's not at all the same grain size or the same spread. So 
what's actually happening in the micro alloy? Um, here you have maximum coupling. You have, if you're a precipitation of um, nobium carb carbide, uh, you're going to have a Zener effect, Zener pinning. You're going to have particles that are going to be pinning the interface. You're going to have a change in the composition of the austenite that's transforming. So um, it's going to result in a modification of the driving force for interface motion, either because you have a withdrawal force, the Zener's force, or because you've changed the composition of the phase. So obviously you're going also going to have to change the elements in the solution. You're going to obviously change the solute drag, uh, friction connected to the solution diffused in a migrating interface. And you're going to do something even more. You're not precipitating niobium. You're uh, precipitating uh, niobium carbide. So you're going to have an additional flow of carbon, a flux of carbon. And transformation of austenite is essentially something which is a, carb a, fl a carbon flux, meaning that the transformation kinetics are going to be changed by an additional flux. So I've just pretty much given you all of all of the reasons to show why things are coupled, and a good way to prove that is by observing it. And depending on the type of transformation, you're going to end up with situations where a precipitation of the NBC is going to occur in the austenite. Then you have the austenite ferric transformation. There are situations where the precipitation of the NBC is going to occur in the ferrite once you've done the austenite ferrite transformation. And then you have this absolutely superb phenomenon which is the case in which you have precipitation of the NBC exactly at the interface between austenite and ferrite. And what happens there is that you have a kind of resonance between the two mechanisms, a kind of wall between austenite and ferrite, which is anchoring, which is pinning on precipitates um, on these walls. It stops them for a while. It hangs around for a bit. There are kind of steps that appear. Um, they accumulate until you reach a critical position where the wall can become de-anchored and re-anchored and de-anchored and re-anchored. And you have this fa fantastic looking microstructure with a, a superb set of planes in which there is a precipitation of NBC, which is uh, exactly concomitant with the uh, austenite ferrite transformation. Which brings me to my conclusion, exactly on time, to yield the floor to Aude Simard. What I wanted to show you with uh, integrated modeling is that there are a lot of things that exist in terms of building blocks that can be adapted to the various cases, which are relevant industrially and therefore relevant in terms of developing te uh, technologically advanced materials, uh, non-isothermal heat treatments and so on, that coupled phenomena can occur and that you need to build physical modeling models to understand uh, the coupling. And what I've just described, I have done so on reasonably simple cases, microstructure evolutions, um, but to control the properties, of course. But it becomes absolutely crucial, this uh, coupled modeling becomes crucial when you're starting to think about op process optimization, where Essentially, you have an external field, a deformation or thermal, um, to a microstructural evolution. And that is going to be uh, discussed in the following seminars. And in order to optimize the end result, you need to use everything you have and use all of these uh, physical metallurgy models as, as simply as possible in order to optimize a process that will result where you have materials that have good properties and they can retain these good properties as components and not just as materials. Thank you so much for your attention.